I got my tambourine. <laughs> make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise in the Lord. Come on, get up, get up, get up. I got my tambourine. I'm coming to wake you up this morning. Get up. It is Sunday. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice. <laughs> oh my God, I'm about to choke. <laughs> I'm about to laugh. Come on, y'all. Get up, get up, get up. Get up, get up, get up. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Listen, the Bible says in Psalm 150, it says, Praise the Lord in this sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him with the acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the timbre and leer. Praise him with the timbre and dance. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything that have breath <laughs> praise the Lord. Come on, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Listen, I'm excited. I got my little tambourine. <laughs> I bought these tambourines, y'all, for the voices of SGS because when we go out, my choir is just praise and worship choir, right? We just excited about praise and worship. And I bought these tambourines so that we can make a joyful noise unto the Lord while we sing it. And I just got so excited this morning. I said, I got to wake them up with this tambourine. Come on. Good morning. I need you to go and purchase you a tambourine while you're in church so you can make a joyful noise. Because the Bible says to praise him with the clash of cymbals and praise him with the resounding cymbals. You got to have some noise. Come on. It's time to make some noise. It's time to make some noise. I'm going to get up and just bless the Lord. I'm so excited today, y'all. I'm excited. Listen, the Bible says in Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, my goodness. I am like, woo. Amos chapter 9, verse 11. I'm going to go to verse 15 in the message version. Listen, I just want to encourage you today. I got to encourage you today because God about to do it. He about to do it. And I read this scripture before, but I got to read it again because God had been doing it, y'all. It says, but also on that judgment day, I will restore David's house that have fallen to pieces. Have your house fallen to pieces. If your house have fallen to pieces and so many things is in disarray and so many things is going all over the place and everything is in calamity, it's a calamity and things are happening. I'm telling you that on judgment day, it says, I will restore David's house that have fallen. I'll repair the holes in the roof. <laughs> if you got holes in your roof, it says, I'll repair the holes in the roof. Replace the broken windows. Fix it up like new. What do you need to happen in your life that need to be like new? God said, I will restore it. It says, David's people will be strong again and seize what's left of, of enemy Edom. Plus everyone under my sovereign judgment, God's decree, he will do this. In verse 13, it says, yes, indeed, it won't be long now. Somebody say it won't be long now. God's decree. It won't be long now. God will restore. He will fix the broken pieces. Everything that's not that's broken, he will make straight again. Whatever it is that needs to be fixed, he will restore. It says things are going to happen so fast, your head will swim. I'm in Amos chapter 9 verse 13. It says things are going to happen so fast your head will swim. One thing fast on the heels of the other. I'm telling you that whatever's about to happen to you, God about to do it fast. <laughs> Somebody say he about to do it fast. It's not going to be in slow motion. It's not going to take a long time. Whatever God's going to do in your life in this season is about to happen now. <laughs> I'm so excited because it says you won't be able to keep up. This is how much he's going to bless you that you won't even be able to keep up. The blessings will just keep coming and coming and coming. I'm telling you the truth that the word of God says in Amos chapter 9, verse 13 to 15. It says you won't be able to keep up and everything will be happening at once. Somebody say the blessings is about to come. They're about to come. If you feel like you haven't been blessed and God haven't been doing it for you, it's about to happen today. It says everything will be happening at once and everywhere you look, blessings, blessings like wine pouring off the mountains and hills. 
Somebody say it's about to be an overflow in my life. It is about to happen now. It won't be long now. It's about to happen so fast your head will swim. <laughs> Somebody say it's happening. The blessings is about to be an overflow. It says blessings like wine pouring off the mountains and hills. I'll make everything right again for my people Israel. Listen, somebody say, make everything right for me, Lord. Just put your hand on your, on your chest and say, make everything right for me. It says, I'll make everything right again. <laughs> somebody say, I receive that. I receive this word today for myself. He said, I'll make everything right again. He'll make everything right with your kids. He'll make everything right with your household. He'll make everything right with your finances. He'll make everything right with your health. He'll make everything right in your family. He'll make everything right in your business. He'll make everything right in your community. He'll make everything right in your neighborhood. He'll make everything right in your mindset. He'll make everything right because the blessings is about to keep coming and coming and coming. And I'm telling you, it's going to happen so fast that your head goes to swing. You won't even be able to keep up. Somebody gonna keep asking you, what's going on? What's happening to you? And you must say, I can't keep up. God just keep blessing me and blessing me and blessing me. Over and over and over and over again. What? We in the sixth month of the year and God have already shown us who he is. He already has shown us. He has blessed us over and over again. But I'm telling you today, you got to receive this word. It says, they'll rebuild their ruined cities. <laughs> if your household is ruined. Whatever is ruined, it said they'll rebuild their ruined cities. You got to know that God's going to give you the strength and the fortitude to rebuild your ruined city. It said they'll plant vineyards and drink good wine. <laughs> Come on, somebody. When you plant your vineyard, when you put seed in the ground, when you get back, your harvest will be good seed. It will be a good harvest that you plant. Whatever you plant, whatever you get back will be good. And you'll be able to eat the good of the land. It says, I, they'll plant vineyards and drink good wine. That means when they plant in grape seed, they'll get that good grape so their wine will be good. Come on. God not going to let you keep playing and keep taking out time for him. And don't think that what you get back is going to be amazing. That it's going to be wonderful. That it's going to be good. That it's going to feel so good. I'm telling you. All that you're doing, all the seeds that you're planting in the earth, all the time that you're taking to read the word, don't think that you're not going to receive goodness from that. It says, they'll work their gardens and eat fresh vegetables. What? I'm telling y'all, God is about to do it in this season today. Everything you plant is going to be fresh. When it comes back, it ain't going to be rotten. It ain't going to be bad. It ain't going to be ruined. It's going to be fresh. It says they'll plant them. It says, and I'll plant them. Plant them on their own land. They'll never again be uprooted from the land I've given him, given them. God, your God says so. So he's letting us know that whatever he promised you, they, nobody will be able to pluck you out of that promise. Nobody will, will be able to take you from that promise. Everything that God said he will give you, you will be able to receive. I'm telling you, this is, they'll never again be uprooted from the land. Well, we know right now that we're studying the book of J Judges, and they're in the land, the promised land. And it says in Amos that they'll never again be uprooted from the land I've given them. Well, you know they was uprooted when all they was... um. To get taken by the different kings and the different, um, the Canaanites and the Amorites and the um, Jebusites, all those different nations was overtaking them. But it says they'll never again be uprooted from the land I've given them. Never again. Every promise that God has given you, you will be able to receive. Uh... Somebody say, I receive it today, that it won't be long now, that everything God has said about me that he will do in Jesus' name. I receive this today for y'all. Things are going to happen so fast in Amos chapter 9. You got to read it for yourself. Amos chapter 9 verse 11 to 15 in the message version. I'm so excited because you won't be able to keep up. Blessings going to keep coming and coming and coming. I'm telling you, it's about to happen right now. It ain't going to take long. So, Lord, we bless your holy and righteous name today. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word. God, we bless you today. We lift you up. We extol you today. We thank you today. 
That it won't be long now. That the blessings will continue to come over and over and over again. That we will, it will come so fast that our heads will swim. Father, I thank you so much that it will come on the feet of the heel of the other. So, Father, we thank you today. <laughs> Father, we thank you that everywhere we look, there will be blessings upon blessings upon blessings. That you will make everything right again for us. So, Father, we thank you. We honor you. We receive this word in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that it won't be long now. It won't be long now. Father, we have been consistent. We have been faithful. We have been diligent. Father, we have studied to show ourselves approved. God, and I ask you today to show up to every single daughter and son that's on this line today. God, I ask you to show up. Let them know that you are God all by yourself. And you will make all things new. Father, I thank you today. I honor you. I lift you up. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray with thanksgiving. Our heart says amen. Amen, amen, amen. Listen, I'm telling you to receive the word today. Today we are... If you don't know, I am Reverend Rashida Lee with Sisters Growing Strong, Soldiers Growing Strong, SGS Ministry. No one left behind. No family left behind. No sister left behind. No soldier left behind. And we are studying the book of Judges. We study line by line, scripture by scripture. And I try to make it as simplistic as I can so that we can learn and study and be able to receive the word so we can regurgitate the word to give it back to somebody else so that they can receive as well. So just a little recap. Um, yesterday, I was at the um, Memorial Park for Juneteenth, and I had a table out front for um, the le leaders on the front line ministerium, and I was doing outreach, just um, passing out um, Bibles and um, salvation tickets. And Michael Tall was there with me. Well, he was actually there for um, some time without me because I was still at the salon. And he kept calling me. He said, Rashida. The people keep asking, where are you at? Where are you at? Everybody keep coming to the table looking for you. And I said, he said, they keep asking for more Bibles. They need more Bibles. He said, all the Bibles that you left here, they're all going. And I'm still giving out the tickets, but they want you. And I'm like, for real, my, he kept calling me, y'all. <laughs> and when I got down there, they were so excited. People are, I'm telling you, people are so excited for the Lord. You think that people are not watching. You think that people are not paying attention, but they want God. And if you come to them and offer them the, the Lord Jesus Christ and let them know they can be saved and that their life can turn around and everything that they're dealing with right now, that God will wipe it away in the sin that they have dealt with in the past, that God will that God will forgive them the minute they repent. I'm telling you that people will want to be around you. They will call on you and they will ask where you at. I'm telling y'all that the harvest is plentiful. You have to share the word of God. I wasn't even down there that long. Because I actually was doing hair too long, do too long at the shop. So I got down there in the nick of time. But it was so beautiful just to see all the people coming to the table. It was so beautiful to know that when I got there, it was no more Bibles left and people were still asking for more. People want the word. But they need somebody to do it. They need people that know the word of God to tell them about Jesus. It's our job in this season. We've been studying the word so much. It's now our job to make sure that we go out into the community, out into the neighborhoods, out to our families, and let them know who Jesus Christ is and share the love of God. Share what he has done for you. Share and let them know that God has blessed me tremendously. He has shown me how mighty he is. You got to let them know. And my job, my mandate, with the leaders on the front line is to do what they ask. And I put a table out there waiting for the pastors to come to share their information, to share, you know, any um, different organizations that they have at their church so that they can get more people in the church because it's more people that do not go to church in the city of Chester than it is that do go. And when I, when I got there, it probably was a couple of ministers that show up, but it wasn't a lot of pastors that show up. And I really want you to know that people want the word. And if we can't, we can't wait on nobody to do it. We can't wait on nobody to share the word of God with our family. We can't wait for people to share the word of God with our loved ones or our community. We got to do it. It's our job. I'm talking to you, SGS ministry. It's our job to take some time out of your schedule. That service at Juneteenth was from 12 to 6. But I only said I was going to be down there for two hours. You don't got to take up your whole day. Just share a little bit of your time throughout the day or to, throughout the week to share the love of God because people need you. They are looking for you. They are waiting for you to share how good God has been to you. And no matter how good he has been to you, it's nothing like giving the word back to somebody else and letting them know that if he can do it for me, he can do the same thing for you. I'm not perfect, but God uses me. And guess what? When he speaks to me and I do it, 
I get blessed from it. And you can be the same way. So when the blessings continue to overflow and overflow and continue to give you what you need, I'm telling you, it's because you're doing the work. So I'm glad and I'm proud of us reading the word of God. I'm proud that we're being consistent. I'm proud that we're being faithful. But now it's time to go out into the um into the fields because the harvest is plentiful. God needs you to start sharing your word. Start sharing your testimony. Start letting somebody know how good he has been to you. Amen. Amen. So today I want to talk about coming as you are. You know, I hear that so much. In the body of Christ, well, I hear it in the body of Christ, I hear it in people that don't go to church. And then when people come to church and they feel like they come in there and look any old kind of way, and people say, Well, I mean, the Bible says come as you are. And you know, I took some time to find out where do it say that in the Bible, come as you are. Because I have not found it nowhere. I studied it, I tried to find it, I, I Googled, I did everything. And I have almost literally I have read the entire Bible in sections in different scriptures and I mean in different um books, not all it from Genesis to Revelation, but different books while I was in school, in seminary school. So I read the whole Bible and I have never once read where it says come as you are. It as um the way you dress. People say come as you are because the way you look. And I have not found that in the Bible at all. But today in the book of Judges, as we study in the book of Judges in chapter three, I'm gonna be reading from chapter three, verse um twelve to verse thirty. But before I begin, um, I wanted to go to a couple verses that says that that kind of implement or not implement, but kind of um, it kind of say a little a highlight of coming as you are. But it don't say come as you are. So I want to get that out of your vocabulary when you're saying to people just come as you are. You know, when they mean come as you are, it means come, come as you are in spirit. Not come as you are with tight jeans and a tank top with half of your back sticking out or some cleavage showing. You know, we, we misuse the word of God so much to make it easy for us. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that. And in this, in this, um, chapter, in Judges chapter three, the, um, the Israelites, God allowed them to come as they are, right? I'm gonna use what people say also. They came as they are. Um, I want to go to Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. I'm going to read these couple scriptures real quick. Where I found that it almost said come as you are, but it don't say it. Um, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Um, verse 18 to 20. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 to 20. It says, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet. They shall be white as snow. So he said, even though you might have so many sins, that if you come to me, I will cleanse all your sins. I will take away your sins. I will cover a multitude of sins for you. This is what he's saying. And then it says, they are, though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. We know wool is white. So they will be white as snow. So no matter how many sins you have, no matter what you have been going through, no matter what you, um, your addictions, no matter what you have, what, um, has happened in your childhood, what happened in your youth, no matter what people have done to you as far as physical abuse or mental abuse, whatever it is, whatever sin you have committed, whatever thing you have done that was not pleasing to God, he says that though they are red as crimson, you know, crimson is a dark red. They shall be like wool. They shall be white as snow. So when you come to God, you can come to him with all your mess, all your stuff, no matter what people remember about you, no matter what God, whatever people say about you, no matter what they thought about you, no matter what you have done in your past, you can come back to God as you are and your sins will be white as snow. Somebody say amen. They can be like scarlet, but they shall be white as snow. It says, if you are willing and obedient. See, when you come as you are, you have to come as you are being willing and obedient. Don't come as you are and just say, I can keep doing what I want because God forgives. I can keep doing what I want because God knows my heart. I can keep doing what I want because God gives us grace and mercy. You cannot come constantly still sinning and constantly going back and forth in your sin and say, well, he said, if I come, my sins are like scarlet and they'll be white as snow if I come. But he says, no, come and let us settle this matter. You got to know that you can't keep being disobedient. 
You got to be willing and obedient. And we know that the Israelites, as we've been studying, we know that the Israelites love the Lord, their God, with all their heart, only when they needed him. But when they wanted to be disobedient, they did what they wanted to do for years. And it says, if you are willing and obedient, somebody say, if I'm willing and obedient, when I come as I am. It says, you will eat the good of the land. See, this is where your blessings going to come at. But you got to be willing and obedient. See, this is the, one of the problems that with Christians, not with non-believers, but with Christians. We want to be disobedient and still want to eat the good of the land. We want to still be blessed, um, blessed, um, all over with an overflow, but we don't want to be willing and obedient. We just want the goodness of God. We want to do what we want to, we want to do as we please, but we don't want to be obedient. And God said, you will eat the good of the land if you are willing and obedient. So you got a choice. And I love the way the word is put in this, um, in Isaiah chapter one, verse 18 and 19, because it allows us to make a decision. And I tell you all the time, it's a decision with Christ. He said, you, you can eat the good of the land. You can receive your sins and start white as snow. But you got to be willing and obedient. And as we have been studying the word of God, as we've been reading chapter by chapter every single day for the last couple months, it's showing obedience and willingness. You are forcing yourself. I know some days it gets hard. I know some days you don't feel like, I know some days you forget. But I'm telling you, if you are willing to make the difference, if you are willing to make the effort, you will eat the good of the land. If you're waiting on your blessing, if you're waiting for God to do it, if you're waiting for God to show up, if you're waiting for God to turn something around for you, if you're waiting for him to do it in the midnight hour, I'm telling you, you have to be willing and obedient so you can come as you are with all your sins that's like scarlet and he will make them white as snow. But you also got to be willing and obedient. It says in verse 20, but if you resist being willing and obedient and rebel, come on, because you know some of us have been rebe rebellious. We want to do what we want. We want to say, say what we want. We want to talk how we talk in your kind of way, do what we want to do, going back and forth, playing games. And it says, if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So you can't keep playing patty cake with God. You can't keep going in and out. Because you will be devoured by the sword. That means you will die in your sin. So I want to make it plain for you today. Because a lot of times we get so caught up in these cliches. And saying oh God knows me. He loves me. You know we've been in church all our life. I used to go to church all my life when I was young. And God knows that I'm coming. I'm going to get myself together. But God said, don't get yourself together. Come with your sins like scarlet. Come. Let them be as red as crimson. But I will make them white as snow. The moment you are willing and being obedient, he will do it for you. And then let's go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I'm going somewhere with this, y'all. I just want to read these scriptures first because... Um, as I was studying, that, that dropped in my spirit, come as you are. And I hear it so much. But God don't want us to just come, just, you know, feel like we could be any old kind of way. Come, you don't get yourself together, just come. But when you come, get right. Try to make a difference. It says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, it says, come to me. He said, you know, come to me. So he ain't giving no prerequisite of how to come. He's not telling you what to do to come. He's telling you, just come to me. It says, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So if you are weary, if you are burnt out, if you are tired, if you can't take it no more, if you just feel like I just got so much on me, he says that if you are burdened, if you are burdened with everything, with so many things that's going on in your family, with your children, with your household, with your finances, and your mindset. If you are burdened or weary, he says, come to me as you are. Come to me just like you are, whatever you're dealing with, and I will give you rest. So don't, don't feel like I'm just so tired, I can't take it no more. Well, when you're so tired, then go to God and just lay in his presence. Take some time and go away. Go to a hotel. And just go and rest in God. If your house got so much calamity, so much stuff going on, just give yourself a moment to come to God. 
Don't turn your phone off, turn the TV off, and just rest in his presence. He says, come to me. So he said, come to me. Come as you are. Come right now. If you're burnt out, come right now. If you can't stop crying, come right now. If you feel so weak, come right now. If you feel like you can't get it together, come right now. If you feel like you you handicapped, you can't get yourself together, I can't walk, I can't talk, I'm blind, I can't see, I'm mentally messed up, I'm spiritually messed up, I need God. But this is why... It's our job to let people know that you can come to God how you are. If we got family members that's messed up, that can't get themselves together, you can tell them right now, come to God. Come to church with me. Come on Facebook Live. Come on the prayer call. Come with me. And I'll show you. I'll show you where it's at. I'll let you know that who Jesus Christ is. And he'll take you just as you are. And then in James chapter 4, James chapter 4, verse 7 to 10. James chapter 4. Verse 7 to 10. It says. Submit yourselves. Then to God. I'm in James chapter 4. Verse 7 to 10. Resist the devil. See we have stuff we got to do. When you come to God. You got stuff you have to do. You got things you have to do. You got to make a choice. It says submit yourselves. That means you got to give up yourself. You got to surrender. You got to put your hands up and say, God, I can't do it no longer by myself. You got to give up yourself. This is how you come to God as you are. You got to submit yourself to God. That means nobody can push you to God. Nobody can do it for you. You got to submit your own self. You got to sign up. You got to sign your name on the dotted line that says, I'm ready, God. I'm ready to make a change. I'm ready to turn my life around. I'm ready to make a difference. I'm coming right now as I am. So you can't force nobody to love the Lord. All you can do is share with them who he is. And it says, submit yourselves then to God. And then it's a, a period. And it stops. And then it says, after you take a, a pause, after you submit yourself and get your mindset together, write down your goals and the things that you need to do for yourself. And then it says, resist the devil. Because I'm telling you, the minute you submit yourself to God, and you really find yourself ready to change, the enemy is going to come like a rushing mighty wind. He's going to come to destroy and kill everything that you already wrote down on the paper to set yourself up and set yourself set aside for God. He's going to say, oh no, I got to keep her on my side. I want her. He's going to find every way to destroy you. So I'm telling you today, it says resist the devil. You got to say no to the enemy. You got to turn yourself from the enemy. You got to make a decision to say, I'm resisting what happened in my past. I'm not going to keep going back and forth with the enemy. It says, resist the devil. The minute you do that, it's karma. It's a pause. After you say, devil, get out of here. I'm not going back to that life. I'm not doing that. I'm not snapping no more. I'm not going to have an attitude. I'm not going to be envious. I'm not going to have jealousy in my heart. I'm not going to be a sinner. I'm not going to keep doing what I want to do. It says, resist the devil. And he will flee from you. But you have to resist the devil. Because he is coming. He's coming. But you got to fight off the enemy. With the word of God. You got to fight off the enemy with your faith. Right? And it says, come near to God. Here we go with that come. Come near to God. And he will come near to you. So, we have a choice. You got to come to him. And then he will come to you. Come near to God. How do you come near to God? You come near to God by reading his word. You come near to God by praying. You don't got to have the perfect prayer. Just share your heart with God. It says come near to God and he will come near to you. The moment you start speaking to God, he will then listen. It says wash your hands. <laughs> and then it's a comma. It's a pause. Wash your hands. We, some of us have sticky fingers. Some of us have a bad hands. Some of us have killed people. Some of us have did things that we know is not right. We have done so many things with these hands. And he says, wash your hands clean. Our hands are dirty. We touching stuff that we know we have no business touching it. <laughs> we feeling stuff. We doing stuff with these hands. He said, wash your hands. Because you keep doing stuff you have no business. It says, wash your hands, you sinners. We are sinners saved by grace. But it says wash your hands when you submit to God. When you resist the devil. When you come near to God. You got to wash yourself clean. Wash your body. Wash yourself clean of the sin. 
It says, and purify your hearts. How do you purify your hearts? A lot of us have a heart full of, uh, like I have a stony heart. Because so many things have happened to us in our families, so many things have happened to us in our marriages, in our relationships, with our children, and we're holding them hostage in our hearts. We're holding people in our hearts hostage. We're holding things um, hostage in our hearts, and we're so upset and mad at people and things because of the things they have done. We have done things to people and won't let it go. And we won't forgive. And I'm telling you, God said, if you come near to me and submit yourself, wash yourself clean, and then you will be able to purify your heart. See, you got to see yourself first. You got to see what you have done wrong first. You got to resist the devil first. You got to get rid of some stuff in your own heart first. And then you can get rid of all the stuff that you are holding. A lot of us have such stony hearts. But we say, hallelujah, bless the Lord. God is good all the time. We say in all these cliches. But our heart is hard and we so mad at people and don't want us to forgive and don't want to forgive. But I'm telling you today that if you're coming as you are to God, you have to purify your heart and be able to go to people and say, I'm sorry or forgive me because I know I hurt you. I messed up. You got to purify your heart so God can give you the blessings in Amos chapter 9 verse 13. If you want the blessings from God to overflow that your head will spin that you, it won't be long now that God will do it for you. You got to purify your heart. That's how you come to God as you are. Come to him as you are all messed up. But then change. It says purify your hearts you double minded. <laughs> I know some of us feel like we're not double minded. But we say one thing out of this side of the mouth. And then say something out of this side of the mouth. And you double minded. So we got to change our mindset. We got to clear our minds. We got to know that the word of God says to follow the commands, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, to love your neighbor as yourself. But the minute somebody do something to us, we snapping, cursing them out, hating them, not liking them no more. We having an attitude. And that's not what God asks of us. He wants us to change. Don't be double-minded. When you coming as you are, you can't be double-minded. It says, I'm in James chapter 4, verse 9. It says, grieve, comma, take some time to grieve. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to cry. It's okay to have moments of sadness. He says, grieve, mourn, and well. It's okay. It's okay sometimes to grieve. It's all right to grieve. In the in the um, Old Testament, he gave them, um what was it, 30 days for them to grieve, and then they, was, they had to then move on. It wasn't a long time after they was able to grieve. Even when it was time for them to bury their loved ones, he gave them two days to bury their loved ones. And then 30 days for them to grieve. And then they moved from the tent and they continued to move on in the wilderness. They did not have a long time to grieve. But it says grieve, mourn, and well. That means you can cry. You can be sad for a moment. You can be, you can have the moments where you just can't get it together in your mindset. And it can sometimes take years. It won't be, it won't happen overnight. It will take time. But then it says, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. See, it's God that will do the lifting. He does the heavy lifting. We can't always think that we'll be the one to do the heavy lifting. I know that we want to laugh. I know that we want to smile. I know that we want to have the moments of joy all the time. But sometimes it's okay to just say, God, I'm just not happy. I'm sad. I'm depressed. I'm feeling low. And he will be the one to lift you up. But in order for him to do that, you have to submit yourself to him. You have to come as you are. I know some of us have dealt with our loved ones passing. And for myself, I dealt with it. I know what it feels like. I lost my mom, I lost my grandfather, then I lost my mom, then I lost my dad. And I'm like, what is going on? And I was able to submit myself to God. I was in the process of being a minister, so God forced me into studying the word of God so much because I wanted to pass the test. But in the meantime, I was going through moments of grieving. But he said, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. So you can give yourself over to God with your sadness. You can give yourself over to God with your depression, with the things that you're going through with your grieving moments. And it's okay. But he will do the heavy lifting when you come to him as you are. So that's good news for somebody. Because somebody might be on here that have been dealing with 
moments of sadness and they feel like, why am I going through this? I'm, I'm supposed to be happy. I'm supposed to be full of joy because I'm a Christian, because God loves me. But we will have the moments. But you, if you submit yourself to God and come as you are and say, God, I, I don't like what, what this feel like. I don't like, I was um in the salon yesterday. And this girl was in there, and she had her mom with her. Her mom was older. Her mom was so cute. And Sharon was like, look at you with your mom. And when she left out, Sharon said, you know, it's nice to feel to see that. You know, it's nice to see somebody with their mom. And Sharon's mom has, been, uh, has passed for so long. And she's like, you know, I haven't had that in so long. And I'm like, you know what? I, I wish that my mom was still here. I could bring her to the hair salon. You know, and it's, it's the moments where you go and think back. Like, Dad, what if I had that right now? How would I feel? But God has done the heavy lifting for Sharon. He has done the heavy lifting for me. He's done the heavy lifting for Rashana. We all have been in them processes where we have lost our mother or lost a loved one. But God has given us the grace to continue on. So if you come as you are and tell God, it do hurt. It don't feel good. I have moments of sadness. You know, we was at the comedy show yesterday. And one of the sisters from Sisters Growing Strong was there. And she was like, yo, I'm just so happy that I'm taking the time to come outside and to push myself after my husband passed away. She said, I feel so good. I'm just so happy now because I took the time to she basically put herself in the middle of her relationship with Christ. She said, I'm going to take my time and be with Christ. I want to take my time to come outside. I'm going to start dating myself again. I'm going to learn who I am. And it's because she submitted herself to God. And now God. God is doing the heavy lifting. God will do the heavy lifting, but we have to do our part too. And I'm telling you, she's like, I I'm not happy all the time. I have moments of sadness. I have moments of grief. But just to see her laugh yesterday, that comedian was so funny. We laughed so hard. And, but it felt so good to hear her say that. She was able to open up and share how she felt so good to be able to come outside. Even though she was grieving, even though it only been a year and a half for her husband to be gone, but to be able to just smile again, it's not easy. But when you put God in it, when you surrender and come as you are, he will do the heavy lifting. <laughs> Somebody say, God will do the heavy lifting for me. You don't got to do the heavy lifting. So today, with a little bit of time I have left, I want to just share, share that with you because in the book of Judges that we're studying today in chapter 3, I want to read this story. Chapter 3, verses um, 12 to verse 30. It's about the Israelites as they um, are now, um, they have done evil in the eyes of the Lord, right? And God has set them a judge. The first judge was Othniel. We learned that last week. And Othniel had the spirit of the Lord that came upon him. And he was able to... Um, to allow the Israelites to live within the land that God had given them for 40 years with peace. Because of his strength, they went to war and they was able to destroy, right, the Cushan Rishathim, king of Aram, um, because of Othiniel, right? And then the Israelites now had peace at this time. But the minute Othniel died, the Israelites went right back to sinning. They went right back to doing what they wanted to do. Amen. And now God in the second and in, in Judges chapter three, verse 12, he sends their second judge. He sent another judge to cover them, to protect them, to be able to fight for them. Right. And it says in Judges chapter three, verse 12, it says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Some Bible says, again, the Israelites did evils in the eyes of Yahweh. And Yahweh was an old English representation of the proper name of the God of Israel. So in some Bibles, you will hear them say Yahweh instead of Lord is L-O-R-D, capital L-O-R-D was Yahweh. And that was um, who, what they called God in those times that they called the Lord was Yahweh. And it says, and because they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. So they had peace for 40 years, but because they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now the Lord have handed them over to the king of Moab, which was Eglon. Now these are the Moabites that they're about to be able to be, they're about to be um, suffering with the Moabites because they continue to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now the Moabites had great military skills. However, the Israelites came as they were. Somebody said, come as you are. 
They came as they were and they came unique for in their own capacity for who they were. Now, the Israelites, they were the um the ones that I'm, I'm going to keep reading first. I'm going ahead of myself. It says chapter chapter three, verse 13. It says getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him. Eglon came and attacked Israel. So the Moabites didn't attack the Israelites by themselves. They had the Ammonites and the Amalekites with them. So these three different nations had attacked the Israelites. And it says, and they took possession of the city of Palms. This is where the Israelites were at. And it says the Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. So they were under the hand of the rule of Eglon for 18 years. However, as they were suffering under Eglon, after the Lord had handed them over to this king, they cried out. It says in verse 15, it says, again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord and he gave them a deliverer. He heard their cry. This is why in the New Testament, when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and his blood was shed, he said that we have an opportunity to call on him. We have an opportunity to repent. We have an opportunity to ask for forgiveness and he will hear us and he will deliver us. This type, this type right here, the type that was given to them, the deliverer Ehud, is a type of Christ. The same way we can cry out to God. The same way the Israelites cried out to God. We have the same power to cry out to God and God will deliver us from wherever sin that we are in. But you have to come as you are. You got to tell him how you feel, what you're dealing with, what you're going through. It says he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left hand, left handed man, the son of Gera, the Benjamite. Now the Benjamite, now the Benjamite, the Benjamites were left-handed. A lot of the Benjamites were left-handed men, right? And it let us know this because they were special. They were different. And I want you to know that these Benjaminites came as they were. God used them as they were. Now, Ehud was the actual leader, which would be the judge. But there were other um, warriors that was with the Benjaminites that was able to fight that was left-handed just like him. He was not alone. He was not the only left-handed man out of this tribe. I'm going to go, I'm going to show you all in one second. It says the Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, the Israelites said, yo, we just got beat. We need your help. Since you are our judge, we need you to now go find the king, King Eglon, and we need you to do something about it. Well, now Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. Now, imagine you got a, a knife on your right thigh, but you're left-handed. If you are fighting, people that are fighting, they will automatically think that you will take your, if you're right-handed, you'll take your gun out of your right pocket to get ready to shoot. But if you're left-handed and you're so skilled with your left hand, you know how to use your left hand with just as if you was using your right hand. So when he had this double-edged sword on his right leg, he was so skilled that he was able to take this left hand to use it, to grab this knife and to use it. You got to look at it in the spirit. You got to see this thing. Because when they let us know that he was left-handed, he was able to do things that other military um, men was not able to do. And they, didn't, they did not check him for a sword on his right thigh or on his left thigh because they would think that it would be on his left. Listen, it says, which he strapped his right thigh under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Eglon, <clears throat> excuse me, to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. Now, with this tribute, they had to give something to the king. They had to bring like a gift to the king. So he presented this gift, which is a tribute. They called it a tribute in this um, version. He presented this tribute to the king. He was a very fat man. It says, after Ehud had presented the tribute, he set on their way those who had carried it. Now, it was other men that came with him that carried this tribute, carried this gift to the, to the king. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your majesty, I have a secret message for you. Now, mind you, his king probably was comfortable 
with him coming back into his palace because he was just there. He just presented the tribute to him. So he was welcoming him back in. So when he welcomed him back in, his servants didn't check Eglon. They didn't do no major checks on Eglon. So he came in with this double-edged sword. They wasn't thinking that he came there to kill him because he just came with the tribute. It says, your majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, leave us. And they all left. So now it's only them two in the room. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. Do you know that the king was not prepared for that? He was, he was side swiped. <laughs> Somebody say, I'm a side swipe the enemy. I'm a side swipe the devil. I'm telling you that we can be that cunning and that slick to come up against the enemy and be able to side swipe them and let them know I'm coming, but you ain't going to know how I'm coming. You're going to let me think that I'm coming the right way. But he came slick saying because he knew that the king had itchy ears. He knew that the king thought that God would say something to him. So he came thinking and believing that you got something for me. No, 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 no. I'm coming to side swipe the devil. You think that I don't know what I'm doing. You think I'm laughing and smiling. You think I don't got it together. But I'm telling you that I already prepared my sword. I already prepared the, and prepared myself for what the enemy has. He already knew that the enemy that was sitting on his throne was fat. He knew that he wasn't easy to run. He knew that he was lazy. He knew that he probably was so puffed up that he was ready to hear something good. But I'm telling you <laughs> that when the enemy come, He's not going to be faster than you. He's not faster than God. He's not ready for what you got set up for him. That's why you got to get the word of God in your heart. So when you know the word of God, you can hit the enemy with the word. You can side swipe him. He think that he's going to kill you. He think he's going to destroy you. He thought that he was going to continue to hold the Israelites under his foot and under their neck. But I'm telling you, for 18 years, they was already held in captivity under the Moabites. And now that they have a judge and a deliverer, God said, I will deliver you. I will find a way to deliver you. I will get you out of the hands of the Moabites and I will send the judge to do it. Well, guess what? God did the same thing for us. He sent Jesus Christ. And because of his blood, he said, I will deliver you. But you got to be prepared with the word of God. You got to set yourself up and know that you got to build up this sword inside of you. What is the sword? The sword is the word of God. You got to get this word inside of you. So when the devil comes, you can sideswipe him. And you can, you can be, you can use your special tactics. Listen, Ehud came as he was. The Benjamin, Benjaminites, they were special. Why? Because they were left-handed men. It says that they were highly specialized troops. I'm telling you that when you come, you're going to come so amazing because they have a perceived, perceived notion of you. They believe that you ain't got it all together. They believe that you don't know what you're doing. They believe it. But that's because they know that you are different. They know that you are, you ain't like them. They know that something is funny about you. They knew that they were left-handed and they were different. But I'm telling you that different is okay. That you can be different. You don't got to be like everybody else. Say, I'm different and I'm not like you. So when I come as I am, <laughs> don't think that I ain't coming right. I'm telling you that they came different. So when you come as you are, don't try to change who you are. Ehud didn't change who he was. He was a special um, troop. He did not come different. He didn't try to act like he was different. He came the way he was. He was left-handed and he used it to his ability. You got to use what you have. Be who you are. Don't try to be like somebody else. Because they look like they got it together. Because they look like they can handle it. They look like they're different. They're better. I'm telling you, if you're different, it's okay. They had exceptional ability. Highly specialized shoot. Able to use a sling or a bow with tactics designed to repel right-handed warriors. 
See, most of the warriors in those times was right-handed. So they automatically knew that the bow and the arrow would come from them pulling their bow back with their right hand. But the Benjaminites were left-handed, so they didn't know which way they was going to attack. Somebody said, you don't know which hand I'm going to use. <laughs> Listen, I want to go to Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20, real quick. I got a couple more minutes. Judges chapter 20, verse... 16. Now, in this time, but Judge, um, Judges chapter 20, this is a story about Micah. He had his wife. They were walking and they were in the, um, they found somewhere to live, right? And when they found somewhere to live, um, in this, in, in Israel, the Benjaminites was, this, this is where the Benjaminites live. And they found somewhere to live, but the men that was knocking on the door, for where he, where, where he was with his wife and the concubine, they came to have sex with him. But he and the, uh, the man in the house that he was living in said, don't rape them, don't mess with the, the man, rape these women. And he gave his wife and the concubine. Yo, this thing is so crazy. But they were the Benjamites, they were Israelites, right? And Micah was an Israelite as well. And because of that, they came upset. They like, what is going on? Why would you do this? Did you know who they were? Well, they raped her. They they on they didn't only rape her, they abused her and she died. They she died, right? He took him, he took her body back. He carried her, cut her body in 12 pieces and sent each piece out and let the Israelites know in each nation, in each tribe, that y'all, the Benjaminites, killed my wife. They, they destroyed her by raping her because they tried to get to me. And now I have a problem. I'm ready to fight. Well, y'all already read this story before. I'm We're going to get to it later. But in, Benjamin, in, Ju in Judges chapter 20, verse 12 to 16, it says the tribes of Israel sent messengers throughout the tribe of Benjamin saying, what about this awful crime that was committed among you? This crime of this woman being raped committed among the Benjaminites. Now those, now turn those wicked men of Gibeah, Gibeah over to us so that we may put them to death and purge the evil from Israel. They like, it's no way that we're going to leave these people in our nation, in our land. We don't want them in our land. They feel like it's okay to do that to their own brothers and sisters, their own nations, to their own lineage. They said, we're going to kill them. We're going to destroy them. We want the, um, the Gibeonites out of here. Well, it says, but the Benjaminites would not listen to their fellow Israelites. Now, it's 12 tribes, and the Benjaminites, this tribe, didn't want to listen to the other 11 tribes. It says, from there, towns, they came together at Gibeah to fight against the Israelites. This one brother, Benjamin, want to now fight against his other brothers in their tribes. These brothers are separating themselves all because of this one act of violence. It says, at once, the Benjaminites mobilized 26,000 swordsmen from their towns in addition to 700 able young men from those living in Gibeah. Verse 16, among those seven, among all these soldiers, there were 700 select troops who were left handed. <laughs> See, Ehud wasn't the only one that was left handed, which was an exceptional ability to be a troop, to be able to destroy people, not knowing which way I'm coming from. It says they were left handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Look at that. They were so exceptional that when they slung a stone and they hit it at somebody, they would not miss. That's how amazing these troops were. The Benjaminites were so skilled that they were able to kill without the people even seeing it. And they would not miss. 
somebody say, I'm that skilled in the word of God. I'm that so built up. I'm that so powerful that when the enemy come and try to destroy me, I will not miss because I'm exceptional. I am amazing. I have power. God has given me the strength to not miss. I am just like the Benjaminites. I will not miss. Why? Because of the word of God that's on my life. Because of the word of God that I read. I can give the word back to the enemy and say, the God said, this is what the word of God said, get me behind me. Because the word of God said that I am the head and not the tail. That I am above and not beneath. That I am a lender and not a borrower. That I am the king's kid. That I am an overcomer. Come on. You got to know. And they were so skilled that they would not miss. So when Ehud killed the king of Eglon, he was so skilled that he did not miss. I'm going to finish reading the rest of this story. I got three minutes. It says, Judges chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message for, from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade. This is how heavy set the man was, the, the king, that when he, when he punctured him, the knife went inside of his body, and his body just covered up the knife. <laughs> he was a very fat man, y'all. It says, and his bowels discharged Ehud did not pull the sword out and the fat closed in over it. Then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. Somebody say you got to have a strategy for the devil. You got to have a strategy for the enemy. You can't just go in ready to kill, but you got to have a strategy already set up. When Ehud went back to the palace, he already had in his mind what he was going to do. And he had a strategy. You can't just go to the enemy talking about get thee behind me. You better have your strategy ready. That you're going to not only have your sword with the word, but you also better fast. You better be praying. You better be built up. I'm telling you. Because the enemy, when he come, he's coming to kill you. It says, verse 24, after he had gone... The servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. And they said he must be relieving himself in the upper room. I mean, in the inner room of the palace. They waited to the point of embarrassment. They like, we got to wait because we don't know how long he's going to be in there going to the bathroom. But he must be, he must be all right by now. So they said, we're going to go in there now. It's been about a couple hours. Like, how long are we going to wait? So they went in there with the point of embarrassment. But when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. So now by this point, they're probably banging on the door. Like, come on, King, where you at? What are you doing? You never in the bathroom that long. There they saw their Lord fall into the floor. Dead. While they waited, Ehud got away. Somebody say that the enemy's going to wait so long that I have time to get away. I'm telling you that you think that the enemy's going to be able to catch you. No, you're going to be able to get away after your strategy has been complete. You'll have a time to get away and he won't be able to catch you. It says he passed the stone images and escaped Syria. While he, when he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill of country of Ephraim and the Israelites went down with him from the hills with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab, your enemy, into your hands. He's letting the Israelites know, come on, listen, I killed the king. We got it. We can take over. We can kill the Moabites now. We got the land. It says, so they followed him down and took possession of the lords of the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Not one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel. 
Look how one minute you're in the hand of the in enemy, and then the next minute you're in the hand of the uh, then the hand of the enemy is now in yours. This is how God will turn it around. He turns things around in the midnight hour, but you gotta not be afraid. You got to make sure that you go up against the enemy. God said, I am the deliverer. I will deliver the enemy into your hands. It's me. But you got to not be afraid. You got to not be scared. You got to say, I got this. I'm going to make it happen. And Ehud single-handedly killed the king because God sent him as the deliverer. God sent him as their judge. Come on. God gave you the same power. You can take on the hand of the enemy. But you got to go with faith. You got to not be afraid. It says at the time they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Now the enemy is going to be vigorous and strong. They, the Moabites was not no weak people. They were ex, 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 mm, exceptionally strong. They were really, really great military uh, men. So they were not no weak men. But God gave them over into the hands of the Israelites all because of Ehud. It says not one escape. That day Moab was subject, made subject to Israel and the land had peace for 80 years. Now they went from their land having peace for 40 years and then they disobeyed God. Then they had peace now for 80 years. <laughs> Somebody say, God, give me peace. But the peace come when you're not afraid to stay, to, to, to allow the enemy to get thee behind you. But you got to come as you are. You got to give God your whole heart. You got to be willing to resist the devil and he will flee from you. You have a choice to make. So I hope y'all received the word today. Let's pray. I, I got a couple of announcements to make before y'all hang up. Don't, don't hang up yet. Let's pray. Most gracious eternal Father, we bless your holy and righteous name. We thank you so much for this word. God, we thank you that we can come as we are, Father, submitting ourselves to you. Father, we thank you that we can come weary. We can come buried. We can come as we are. We can come sad and depressed. We can come grieving. We can come mourning. And you will do the heavy lifting. You will lift us up. Father, we thank you so much, God. Father, I thank you for all those that are on here that are having moments of sadness, moments of depression, moments of loneliness. God, the they're sad and they're crying in the midnight hour. God, I ask you to lift them up today, God. Give them joy, God. Give them laughter. Father, I ask you today to do what you do best, God. Show up like never before. Father, I ask you to send them peace right now in the midst of their storm. Father, those that have joy, I ask them to share their joy with their sisters and brothers in Christ. God, share the joy and the love that you have for them so that they can let them know that you receive them as well, no matter how they are to come to come as they are unto you. Father, so we thank you today. We honor you. We lift you up. Father, we thank you that we will have the same strength like Ehud, the second judge of the Israelites, that he was not afraid to use his special ability. God, that he was not afraid to use his left hand to be able to, to, be able to do what was necessary to kill the king. So, Father, we ask you to use who we are. Father, that we don't have to change a thing. That if you we use who we are, we will be able to do what is necessary in the kingdom. So, God, we thank you. We love you. We honor you. There might be somebody on here that do not know Jesus Christ in a part of their sins. Or they have backslid. And I need you to know that God is married to the backslider. And no matter how you are, God said you can come to him. And he will save you. And will remove every sin that your past will no longer be, will no longer be a problem for you. That he will erase it. And you can start brand new. So if you can repeat after me with a sincere heart, you will be saved immediately. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. And I believe you came to earth. And I believe you died on the cross for me. And I believe you shed your blood for me. And I believe you rose from the dead. Right now, I come to you, Lord Jesus, because I am a sinner. Forgive my sins. Cleanse me with your blood. Make me clean. And I will be clean. Come into my heart. Save my soul. I no longer belong to Satan. I belong to you. I am forever yours. And I am now saved. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Listen, I have a couple of announcements. Saturday, June 22nd. If you are not busy at 12 o'clock, the Voices of SGS, the choir will be singing at Murphy Asbury AME Church. I would love for y'all to be there. 
It's at 12 o'clock at Murphy Asbury. That is um, on Yarnall Street in Chester, Pennsylvania. Also, July 11th, I have three different um, events that I would like for you guys to attend if you're able to. I want you to write these days down because I'm sharing it with you first. I'm giving y'all a week to purchase y'all tickets if y'all are able to come. And then I'm going to put it on Facebook next week. July 11th, we are having gospel karaoke at the Operation Look Forward under um, Pastor Nate Jacobs. We're going to have it at his ballroom over town. It is $10. I will be celebrating my birthday there. That's July 11th. That's a Thursday from 6 to 9. If you are available, come out and celebrate with us. We are trying to find different things to go to, to do during the weeks. I'm um, doing a week um, in the downtown area of Chester. So we are going to start with our first event over um, over at the Operation Look Forward um, location. It is not a cabaret. They will be selling food there. So if you come, come and to enjoy yourself. I hope that you come and celebrate my birthday with me. That is Thursday, July 11th. It is $10. If you are going to cash app, it will be $12 um, for cash app. Also, on um, July 19th, we will be having bingo. That will be at my ballroom. That's a Friday night. Bingo, it will be from 6 to 10. We'll be having bingo and a little bit of the line dancing so we can have a little bit of fun. That will be bingo. That is $30. That will be for 10 games. We will have an amazing time. That will be at Sanayi or Ballroom on July 19th. That is a Friday from 6 to 10. You are, I'm asking you first. So please, 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 if you are going to do it, please send your $30. This week, because I'm putting it on Facebook next week, I told y'all that next time I have anything, I will share with y'all, you guys first, because of the limited space. Then on July 26th, um, at the, um, it's a ballroom that just opened up called the Ave. It's where the old Chester Brewery was at. Um, we're having a, a karaoke spoken word and poetry night. That will be from six to nine. That is on a Friday as well, July 26th. Um, so if you have any time throughout any of those days, and that's $10 as well. And if you're going to cash app, it'll be $12. So if you have the time to put in your schedule, if you can come to one of them, you can come to all three, I would love to see you there. I'm telling y'all now so that y'all can make sure y'all get your tickets before anybody else does. Also, we are reading um, 1 Samuel chapter 8 today. We are on 1 Samuel chapter 8. So keep reading your word. Do not stop. Please do not stop reading your word. I know y'all have been enjoying it. It's been so good. First Samuel been so good. So I love y'all. God bless you. Have an amazing, amazing Sunday. I thank God for you. Make sure that you share your testimony with somebody. Let them know that Jesus still lives and he lives with inside of you. I love y'all. Have an amazing day. And please share this live. God bless you. I love y'all. Have a good day.